on October 13th. Andrea Mitchell of NBC News asked the Vice President if he would agree to a third debate. The Vice President said four times in his two-minute reply, no, under no conditions would he agree to another debate. He said the American people were up to here, fed up with debates. <clears throat> The governor chose not to respond to uh, what it is that the vice president said, but I am prepared tonight to break a secret. Immediately after that debate, the vice president and the governor agreed that there would be a third debate, and we're having it here tonight. <laughs> Neither one has chosen to show up, uh, so uh, they have both sent surrogates. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce first Professor Joseph Nye, who's the Ford Foundation Professor of International Security here at the Kennedy School and Director of the Center on Science and International Affairs. And Dr. Richard Haas, who is a lecturer in public policy, um, he is going to take the uh, position of the Vice President, and Professor Nye will take the position of Governor Dukakis. The way this debate will work, each will speak for 10 minutes, <clears throat> excuse me, and then each will have a two-minute opportunity to rebut the other. I will then ask each of them questions, and then we will turn to you in the audience for a series of questions as well. I hope that you will bear in mind that I'm going to attempt to keep this thing fair, and that means that if there are too many questions going in one direction, I'm going to stop it and we're going to move in another direction. So it's up to you to keep the balance going between uh, both of our speakers. Our first speaker is Professor Nye. It's nice to have a uh, intra-boutique debate. It's a little less embarrassing for me, perhaps, and for Dr. Haas to be inside the boutique. But uh, let me say in starting that uh, I don't find this a very edifying campaign. I think it's been a campaign thus far which has not dealt very well with the issues. Uh, if you want the good news about that, it might remind you a little bit of Mark Twain's uh, comment about Wagner's music. He said, remember, Wagner's music is nowhere near as bad as it sounds. Uh, and that's perhaps the motto of this campaign. What you have are two men who are actually quite decent people from the centers of their parties, uh, but in which they have not produced, a, I think, a interesting debate on the foreign policy issues. Uh, it's true that perhaps the reason for that is that there's less difference between the parties on foreign policy than there was uh, in the last four campaigns. Uh, it could be argued that the big change in American policy came be between the beginning and end of the Reagan era, and that that made it less of a foreign policy year. Could also be that we're in the middle of something you might call, with Marvin's uh, permission, uh, trivialization by TV, uh, in which everything is reduced to uh, 30 to 60 second bites, no matter what the message is. But it also could be that the campaign has been one in which the characterization and caricaturization has been extreme. Uh, statements like, Governor Dukakis likes nothing in the weapons systems beyond the slingshot are simply false, but they have been given a lot of prominence. Or statements that Governor Dukakis is in favor of unilateral disarmament or innuendos to that area to that extent are similarly false, but uh, have given a good deal of prominence. Or statements such as the Vice President made at the, Demo at the Republican Convention, uh, saying that uh, the U.S. Uh, Dukakis believes the U.S. is in decline, uh, indicate that he didn't do his homework, because Dukakis had said just the contrary. And like a lot of things said about Dukakis was not true. Or a statement a week ago in which he called upon Dukakis to join him in refusing to withdraw troops from Europe when Dukakis had made a public speech to that effect in June. I mean, there's a strange use of innuendo, slogan, and so forth, which I think has helped in this trivialization of the foreign policy debate. Rather than repeat that tonight, let me step back from it and ask, where are we as a people, the American people, in the end of the 1980s, and where should we be going for the 90s, and which campaign and which candidate would do better for that. As I step back and look at the Reagan years in the 80s, I think Reagan deserves credit. He deserves credit for restoring a degree of American confidence, 
perhaps for overcoming part of the post-Vietnam syndrome. He also deserves credit for changing his position on the Soviets, from moving from a position which was too rigid to a position which essentially used negotiation. But I think the fact that his earlier efforts in defense uh, were made probably helped to, uh, to allow him to cash in on the end. I think he deserves credit for that. What he doesn't deserve credit for, and what is left for the rest of us, is a large problem, which is he didn't pay for it. He didn't pay for it in the sense that he built up defense in a rather wasteful way, and he cut taxes, and he expected that that would lead the Congress to have to cut social spending. And when the Congress didn't cut social spending, essentially he borrowed from abroad. The net effect of borrowing from abroad was to drive up the value of the U.S. currency, to restrict American exports, to hollow out American industry, to turn us from a net creditor into a net debtor in the world, indeed the largest debtor in the world, and in that sense to give us a decade of borrowed prosperity, which has made us feel good, but was not made us better. In that sense, as one looks ahead as a vision for the future, a vision for the 1990s, one has to ask what are the kinds of questions that we're going to face as a people, and it strikes me that any sensible strategy for the 1990s is going to have to have five parts to it. And if those five parts tend to echo a speech that Governor Dukakis gave as long ago as Derry, New Hampshire in January in this field, it perhaps is no accident. But let me echo them for you tonight. The first and most important foreign policy priority for the United States is to rebuild the domestic basis of American economic strength. That means getting to terms with the fiscal deficit, getting to terms with the trade deficit, raising savings rates and investment in R&D. The second most important issue on the foreign policy agenda is keeping an open international economy and maintaining international economic cooperation. That a retreat into protectionism would surely be a way to accentuate decline that essentially it's important that we become competitive with the rest of the world, not that we retreat from the rest of the world. Third is we have to keep the alliances that we have and maintain a strong defense, essentially committing ourselves to NATO, to our alliance with the Japanese, is important so that we don't see a situation in which American strength is reduced, but in which American strength is leveraged by the keeping those alliances. What's more, keeping those alliances is important for the fourth point, which is negotiating with the Soviet Union. Negotiating with the Soviet Union means completing the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, going ahead with conventional stabilization talks for reduction of conventional weapons in Europe, and essentially challenging Gorbachev to follow with deeds many of the interesting words that he has proposed. Now let's look at that agenda item, which I think comes out of where we are in the world today, and ask how the candidates stack up on those five major items of foreign policy. Well, on an open international economy, they both stack up pretty well. They both have resisted protectionism. Dukakis ran, as you will remember, against protectionism in the Democratic primaries. Bush, I think, would continue the, the current administration's positions in this area. I think there's not an awful lot to choose for them between that on one of the five. Another one where they're fairly similar, they're not exactly the same, is on dealing with the Soviet Union. And in dealing with the Soviet Union, you will remember that uh, what you have in the positions is that Governor Dukakis is committed to build on the Strategic Arms, strategic arms Reduction Treaty that President Reagan has started and to also give a high priority to conventional arms reductions in Europe. Indeed, he made a very interesting speech in Chicago challenging Gorbachev to a number of specific proposals in that area and has also committed us to having a strengthening of conventional capabilities to make sure that we have strength to bargain from. I would say that if you sum up the difference between the candidates there, it's probably not as great as in some other areas, but I would go along with the editorial in the New York Times on Sunday which said, for those who think the future will follow the familiar path of the present, the choice is Mr. Bush. For those who think the future can hold unexpected promise, the choice is Mr. Dukakis. I tend to prefer the future. What about the other three items that were on my list of five things that we face as a people for the 90s? 
Well, the most important of those that strikes me is the deficit of bringing our house uh, into balance at home. And there I think it's true that neither of the two candidates has been terrifically heroic, but I'll say that Governor Dukakis has been pretty honest in saying that he has not ruled out taxes as a last resort. Now that may not be the, uh, the same as pledging that you will raise taxes, but it is a lot different from pledging that in no way, in any circumstance, in any means, we will ever increase taxes. Now it's interesting if you think about that, what that means. Let me quote to you from a, well, let me cite you first, a Republican economist here at Harvard, who is Martin Feldstein, who argues that with the flexible freeze and rosy projections of growth, you might get the deficit down to 1% of GNP, but it's hard to see how you're going to get that final 1% without raising taxes. Or to put it in the terms of another Republican economist, Herb Stein, again in last Sunday's New York Times, in his own words, it's time to ask the 86% of the American people who are not poor to give up some small part of the increase in their consumption in order to fortify the national security to provide more adequately for the future growth of the national income to improve the lot of the poor among us. That sounds like a pretty good statement from a Republican economist and pretty close to Governor Dukakis, if not to Vice President Bush. What about the issue of defense? Well, defense is one... And you're concluding one minute. All right. And you're concluding one minute. I will tell you that defense, both candidates are pledged to the same level of defense, but Governor Dukakis has given you specific numbers of how to squeeze $400, million, $400 billion into $300 billion. And in that circumstance, Vice President Bush has mentioned only one program he'll cut, the Himmet truck, which is worth one half of $1 billion. And let me tell you on that, I think that I again agree with the New York Times, which says about uh, Governor Dukakis, he at least understands what Mr. Reagan never did, that the national defense can be no stronger than the national economy. Mr. Bush may know that, but he is yet to show it. Since I have 30 seconds left, I'll mention that the fifth item was the need to develop more attention to multilateral issues, to deal with the international debt crisis, to relieve the burden from the developing countries, to deal with problems of drugs and AIDS and nuclear proliferation, Governor Dukakis has spoken on all these issues, spoken intelligently. Uh, I've heard nothing but silence, in effect, from Vice President Bush. So basically, if I look at those five major items that we face as a people as we approach the 90s, it strikes me that on two of the five, the candidates may be close. On three of the five, it's a clear advantage to Dukakis. And it'd be interesting if my opponent tonight, uh, the distinguished Dr. Haas, would reply not with innuendo and slogans about unilateral disarmament, but with specific examples of how Vice President Bush prepares to reduce the deficit, to meet that crunch in the defense spending, and to deal with multilateral interdependence issues. Thank you. As Professor Nye has already indicated, is the distinguished Dr. Richard Haas. Thank you, Professor Kalb. I'm often referred to in Washington among some of my friends as the Joe Nye of the, the Bush campaign. <laughs> And after tonight, I take that as a compliment. Before tonight, I took it as a compliment as well, but I think you can see why I would. And as a result, let me begin with my conclusion. <laughs> and I'll work my way through it, because the problem with Governor Dukakis and his campaign is clearly not Joe Knight. And I would add, by extension, it is not Al Carnesale or Graham Allison or Bob Murray or several of the other people at this school who are advising the governor. They are clearly class acts. They are clearly members of what I would call the mainstream of American foreign and defense policy. Joe, in particular, has just written an article on the current issue of foreign policy, which I think, as well as anybody, uh, rebuts the thesis of um, our colleague from Yale, Paul Kennedy, that America is in decline. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that Joe Nye is not the Democratic candidate. 
and that Michael Dukakis is. And that I think that what one has to do is ask not whether Joe Nye is in the mainstream, we know he is. The question is whether Michael Dukakis is in the mainstream. And I think the answer is not. Now Joe and others are claiming that he is, and that actually there's quite a very little difference in some key areas of, of foreign and defense policy between the governor and the vice president. Well, I think that though raises a key problem for Joe and others. Because if Joe is right, and there really is very little difference between the governor and the vice president, then I think quite a lot of you and quite a lot of those who are supporting the, the governor from Massachusetts are going to think something's wrong. Because you're supporting him, I presume, because you think there's a difference. But if I'm right, and there is that difference, and that Governor Dukakis is outside the foreign policy and defense policy mainstream of this country, then I think the American people are going to be disappointed with the governor should he ever enter the Oval Office. And what I'd like to do in the next eight minutes or so is say something about where I think George Bush stands on a lot of these issues, and then contrast it with where Michael Dukakis stands. To uh, coin an old phrase, I think there is a... Um, there's a clear choice, uh, and, and not simply an echo here in this campaign. George Bush, as we would say in our, the course that Dick Neustadt and I teach on uses of history, to place him in time is a man who comes out of World War II, is a man whose worldview was formed by the Cold War, is a realist, and is clearly a member, again, of the bipartisan foreign policy establishment. The key tenets which guide his foreign policy are the primacy of the Atlantic Alliance and the U.S. relationship with Japan, the containment of the Soviet Union, the need for strategic deterrence, the need to maintain a liberal trade order, the need on certain occasions for the United States to use military force, and the importance of promoting democracy around the world. And I, for one, think that the inheritance of the Reagan-Bush administration in those areas is uh, quite impressive. I'm not the first person to point out that peace and prosperity exist, but they do. The world is, by contrast to most other epochs, much at peace. U the U.S. economy has now been growing at an unprecedented rate for something like five years. Containment is working. When George Kennan, over 40 years ago, wrote his key essay on containment, he had two goals. It was to stop the Soviet Union from expanding abroad, and it was to bring about what he called the internal mellowing of Soviet power. Well, lo and behold, both are happening. We are now witnessing the contraction of the Soviet Empire, witness Afghanistan, and we are now witnessing unprecedented economic and political reform at home in the Soviet Union. NATO is strong. We just had the experience of the INF Treaty, where in the face of unprecedented Soviet pressure, First, the Atlantic Alliance de deployed a new generation of missiles, and then it stood firm and negotiated an agreement which got rid of an entire class of nuclear weaponry. Democracy is on the rise. Right now, 90% of Latin Americans live in democratic countries. South Korea, which just held the Olympics, is clearly on its way to having a full democracy. The Philippines is clearly on its way to having a full democracy. Meanwhile, on the economic front, the trade deficit is coming down. U.S. exports are at record levels. And perhaps most important, the U.S. free enterprise model of economic thought is on the ascendant. This is as true in China and the Soviet Union as it is throughout Latin America. So our ideas are winning democratically and economically. I don't mean to sound complacent. I could lead, you know, present a long laundry list of the challenges. And I expect they will come up in the questions, everything from drugs to terrorism to some of the issues Joe raised about defense modernization to budgets to <clears throat> world debt. And there's new challenges. The environment, things like global warming, ozone, deforestation. There's challenges of another new sort, the proliferation of ballistic missile technology. We just saw in the Iran-Iraq war the growing spread of chemical weapons, not simply their possession and their use. So it's clear that the new administration is going to face a daunting agenda. But again, I think the inheritance is good. Let me contrast this with the few minutes I've got left with Governor Dukakis as I see him. First, his worldview. I would say it is largely formed not by World War II, but by Vietnam. 
the lesson being drawn that the biggest threat to peace in the world is often the unilateral use of force by the United States. His intellectual heir, if you will, or precedent rather, is, is Woodrow Wilson. Michael Dukakis is very much in the Wilsonian tradition. Very optimistic worldview, very much hopes that our, our swords can be, torn in, can be turned into plowshares. Very much believes in international cooperation, whether it was the League of Nations then, or the United Nations, or the Organization of American States now. And I think as one goes down the list on some key issues, one sees some important differences between the candidates. On nuclear deterrence, for example, over the last few years, Governor Dukakis supported the nuclear freeze and was against the ground wave emergency network, which, was used, which would be used to communicate with U.S. forces in the event of a nuclear attack, the only governor to oppose it. He now favors the comprehensive test ban, a ban on all ballistic uh, missile tests, both of which would make it impossible for the United States to modernize its strategic deterrent. And he's also unwilling to commit himself to a new land-based ICBM, one of the three key legs of the strategic triad. Professor Nye referred to the speech that the governor gave in which he said we have to challenge the Soviet Union. We have to test Mikhail Gorbachev. That's great, but let's look at one of the tests. Central America. The governor said we should ask Mr. Gorbachev to stop sending arms to the Sandinistas. Or what? The governor already opposes our doing anything, for example, such as aiding the democratic resistance, the Contras. Where is the incentive for the Soviet Union to pass the test that the governor has laid out? Where is the penalty if and when the Soviet Union fails the test? The United States has not been giving military aid to the Contras for nearly a year now. What have we seen in Central America, in Nicaragua? We have seen continued Soviet help, and we've seen a crackdown on the internal opposition. What is the governor proposed to do in the absence of the Soviet Union passing this clear test? In South Africa, we have the governor opposing aid to Jonas Savimbi's UNITA. Well, right now we're on the verge of perhaps a major breakthrough in the diplomacy of Angola. What does he propose to do? How does he think that diplomacy will succeed in the absence of U.S. support for one of the key parties? And how does he think that sanctions right now against South Africa will give the South African government to follow through on its commitment to grant Namibia independence. Over one million blacks will be free of apartheid if Namibia becomes free. What does the governor propose to do to help them? Economically, I worry about the so-called spirit of economic patriotism, which seems to me to pose a departure from the historic tradition of liberal trade. And more generally, I worry about almost the allergy, I would describe it, against the use of force. We've seen force have a necessary and useful role in Grenada. We've seen it have a necessary and useful role in Libya, where terrorism has clearly been discouraged. We've seen most recently the American deployment of ships to the Persian Gulf help create a context where Iran finally realized it had no self-interest in continuing the war, but instead finally realized that it was forced to go to the bargaining table. So then I end where I began. Is Governor Dukakis in the mainstream? It seems to me on the key pillars or tenets of American foreign policy, on a foreign policy that has largely worked for 40 years, I'm sorry to say he is not. And I think Vice President Bush, if one looks at the key, the key elements of his foreign policy, is squarely placed and what until recently has been a bipartisan tradition. And one only hopes that in the aftermath of this election, the Democratic Party draws the right lessons and understands that in order to get elected, it's going to have to promote candidates who stand within and not outside the bipartisan mainstream. Thank you. Okay, we now have an opportunity for each uh, uh, to offer his rebuttal, and I call upon Professor Nye to do that first in two minutes. Well, let me quickly make a couple of points about what uh, uh, Richard Haas has said. Was Vietnam the shaping influence on Michael Dukakis? No. Korea. He was a soldier in the Korean War. He also spent time in Peru and saw what it looks like to live in a developing country. Uh, I think he's got his decades wrong. I'll tell Neustadt about that. <laughs> International organizations, is that, uh, is that a sign of naivete? On the contrary, in a more complex world in which you've got to deal with drugs and AIDS and proliferation, you're going to need organizations like the World Health Organization relating to AIDS. Uh, 
or like the UN Environment Program relating to global CO2 problems, or like the International Atomic Energy Agency relating to problems of nuclear proliferation. That's na not naivete, it's giving leverage to American strength. What about the freeze and his support for the freeze? I should remember uh, that in 1982, the freeze was supported by 70 to 80 percent of the American people, according to the various public opinion polls. Why? Because you had in the Reagan administration a group of people who were talking about fighting and winning a protracted nuclear war. In face of that sort of nonsense, the freeze was a way of saying, hey, enough is enough. This nuts. And it's interesting to notice that eventually President Reagan got that message, and they did change their position. He does not support uh, that situation today. Governor Dukakis is backed on terms of deterrence has talked about the need to modernize the legs of the strategic triad, indeed on the submarine and air-breathing legs, the, the D-5 missile and the stealth bomber, he urges to go ahead with it, contrary to the ads you may have heard on television. Where he differs is on the land-based leg of the triad, and there the interesting point is that the MX missile in rail garrisons, which has been uh, something pres that Vice President Bush has talked about, won't do what it's supposed to do. And the midget man at $50 billion doesn't fit within any kind of reasonable defense budget of constant at $300 billion, which Vice President Bush says he favors. What Dukakis has said, he'll work with the Congress, particularly with Les Aspen of the House Armed Services Committee, who's looking at a set of alternatives which would cut the price of that modernization in half. Now, in that sense, it's worth noticing that uh, Professor Haas did not refer or answer any of the questions that I raised, bringing up these questions about defense budget and how you're going to squeeze $400 billion into a $300 billion budget or how you're going to solve the deficit problem. Uh, I didn't hear any answers to that, but I think that's in tradition of the Bush campaign. Okay. Uh Your opportunity for two minutes, please. The man, Governor Dukakis, may have been in Korea, but the values are clearly the values of Vietnam. One sees it in the almost reflexive opposition to the use of force. Let me, though, instead of answering Joe point by point, let me just point out a few things which I, de I think deserve highlighting, and then I will come to the two issues he mentioned at the end. International organizations have a role. The UN, the World Health Organization, and the rest. Right now, we're giving large amounts of sums to UN peacekeeping forces. But they have a role. We can't start contracting out our foreign policy to organizations that have demonstrated time and time again an inability to act. I'm all in favor of working with the OAS, but the OAS has to demonstrate a capacity and a willingness to deal honestly with the fact that right now we have serious non-compliance by Nicaragua with the Contadora and the Esquipulas II or the so-called Arias plan. And in the absence of strong international organization reaction, what then is the United States supposed to do? It's not enough to chant the mantra about support for international organizations. They can be an adjunct of American foreign policy, but they are not a substitute for it. If we had gone along with Governor Dukakis's policy, we would never have deployed Pershing II missiles. We would never have deployed the ground launch cruise missile. We would not have had a bargaining chip. And right now you would have several hundred Soviet warheads atop SS-20 missiles in Europe, and we would have no Western military response, and we would have no INF treaty. I think there's a lesson to be learned from this. When Governor Dukakis only reluctantly admits there may have been some relationship between Western deployments of forces and Soviet willingness to sign the treaty, I think it says something. I think that when people analyze a political campaign, and when you look at the candidates, to some extent you're forced to look at tea leaves. And the tea leaves that I see here are a clear reluctance to acknowledge any relationship or any significant relationship between the role of force and diplomacy. And I just think that too often in our history, those who have been unwilling to see the connection between the two have set and trained policies that in the end have proved much more costly. Okay, well thanks uh, to both of you and what we're going to do now is move into the next phase of this uh, debate, our gathering tonight. Uh, I'm going to throw a couple of questions at each one of them and then uh, if you want to ask a question there are four microphones around that I see and you're more than welcome to come on up to the microphone and I'll try to recognize you. Uh, the first question I would like to ask of uh, Professor Nye is that uh, Dr. Haas talked a great deal about 
Governor Dukakis being out of the mainstream. Uh, it's a phrase that we have heard throughout the campaign. Why is it, in your view, that so many Americans seem to understand what it is that the Vice President and Dr. Haas are saying by using that expression? And why does it have that kind of, uh, uh, why does it evoke such strong negative feelings? Well, it's an interesting question because if you look at Dukakis's position, which is support for the NATO alliance, strengthening conventional defense, keeping nuclear deterrence, modernizing the nuclear deterrent, resisting protectionism, those are very much the mainstream. But if you look at what happened in the month of August, when after the Republican convention you had a series of negative advertisements saying that Dukakis favored no defense system since the slingshot, or if you look today to an ad that Senator Tower just made, which said that Dukakis essentially is still resisting modernization, or you look at the types of innuendos in the debate in which you premise a statement by talking about unilateral disarmament won't help you, I think that gives people who haven't looked at the position papers a feeling that, yes, this is somebody who's for unilateral disarmament and therefore is outside the mainstream. The fact that he isn't, uh, or that his positions are in the mainstream, never gets through. The 30-second bites or the brief glimpses that you get through television I think convey an impression which is not an accurate impression. Uh, if the American public got its news from reading newspapers, or if they ever read position papers, they'd know as far back as last January what these Dukakis positions are. But in a world in which 70% of the American people get their news from television, in which Dukakis can give a speech about a serious issue and it'll get 30 seconds on the evening news, I think it's pretty easy for innuendo to beat argument. But but are you saying thereby that the fault for the governor's current position lies strictly within the television coverage? No, I, don't, I think the fault uh, is partly the Gukakis campaign in, in August. We essentially lost the month of August. Uh, there wasn't a reply to the Bush uh, attacks. And by the time the replies came in September with well-reasoned speeches, it looked like we were on the defensive and the innuendo had already stuck. Um, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Haas, a question uh, that emerges from a phrase that you threw out as you ticked off the wonders of the Reagan foreign policy. You, talk, you talked about 90% of Latin America now being democratic. The United States is a democratic country. Do you believe that 90% of Latin America has the same kind of democratic system that we have here in this country? I don't think that to describe countries as, as democratic, one necessarily has to have an exact replica of what the United States has. Great Britain is clearly a democratic country, does not have the same system. Uh, Brazil has clearly become a largely democratic country, and one could go down the list. Well, I think what is important in defining what a minimal democracy is, is not necessarily something that Thomas Jefferson would recognize the moment he walked out of his time capsule, but that there be some key ingredients. For example, some means for orderly and institutionalized succession, some capacity for holding free and fair elections, some guarantees Don't of, the last free and fair elections held well, in Latin Marvin, America. let me just finish the point. Also, there's got to be some guarantee of independent access to key institutions, for example, media, for the right to organize. Let's look at what just happened in Chile the last week. That clearly is not a democracy. But what is interesting to me is that even in Chile, you had the opponents of General Pinochet able to get amazing amounts of television time, able to hold rallies, able to move in and out of the country, and you had a vote that actually went against the government. Now, it still remains to be seen over the next 18 months whether things continue on track. Clearly, we have not yet turned the corner in Chile, but we are making progress. And I don't think it's, it's useful to think of democracy if you have an image in your mind I don't think it's that useful to think necessarily of a switch. No, but you use the phrase in order to achieve a specific objective. You wanted to convey an impression. You said 90% of Latin America right. is democratic. I want to ask you specifically, where, give me the countries, where were the last democratic elections held in Latin America, and where is there a free press in Latin America? I think that 90% of the... No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, just a second. I believe that 90% of the people of Latin America are now living above what I would consider to be a basic or essential democratic threshold. 
and I would say this covers countries, and uh, I can get ready for the crowd reaction here, as broad as situations as Brazil and Uruguay, uh, even Peru, even though I don't necessarily applaud all the acts of the government. I think in Central America, places like Costa Rica, Honduras, even now El Salvador and Honduras, Guatemala, and I think in these countries, again, one is not necessarily saying that we have reached perfection in each one of what I think to be the key avenues of succession, of free and fair elections, and guaranteed access to institutions, but I think we have clearly gone above a meaningful threshold of democracy, and I think to ignore that or to deny that is simply to close your eyes to reality. Okay. Do you believe that the, uh, the use of the term 90% of Latin America is democratic is an exaggeration? No. Again, I think 90% of the people... But then have... would you give me the answer to my two questions about a free press and free elections? I just went through a list no, of... No, no, you, you gave me a minimal thresholds. Those countries have largely free presses and largely free elections. I think that, okay, that is a, it is across the threshold. Then we have different understandings of what a free press is and a free society is. But let me move on. Professor and I, I'd like to ask you a question about the Middle East. Um, do you believe that if a Dukakis administration came into office, that within a period of six months there would be first a renewed burst of diplomatic activity in that area designed in one way or another to involve the Palestinians in the peace process, and by Palestinians I mean the PLO? And do you feel that a Dukakis administration would or should extend normal diplomatic recognition to the PLO? What Governor Dukakis has said is that he believes peace in the region has to be brought about by direct negotiation of the parties. And as for the PLO, he's argued that the PLO has to be willing to accept the security of Israel, which means accepting the relevant United Nations resolutions which embody the framework for peace in the region, which include uh, recognition of Israel and acceptance of the security of Israel. Whether it would be wise to spend the first six months of a new administration with a burst of new diplomatic activity on the Middle East is, a, is an open question. I personally am not sure it would be. I think that it might make more sense to use a more indirect strategy of nudging the parties in the area closer to each other. If a new president blunts his sword and expends all his political capital on efforts to get a second Camp David before the setting is ripe, then you may damage the prospects for actually moving the peace prospect forward later. So I don't know what the choice would be. I'm not sure I would, recogni would recommend a strong burst of activity in the first six months. Okay. I appreciate that the question is somewhat hypothetical, but from all of the reporting, one gets the strong impression that the PLO, when it meets next month after both the Israeli and American elections, will proclaim uh, the establishment of a government in exile uh, will say that it recognizes the relevant resolutions of the United Nations, uh, 242 and 338. And if indeed the PLO does that, as strongly indicated it would, does that not satisfy the September 1975 agreement between the United States and Israel, and would a Dukakis administration then open direct talks with the PLO? Well, as you said, it's hypothetical in the sense you're talking about a PLO which has considerably changed its spots. If the PLO does accept the existence of Israel and recognizes those UN resolutions and gives up acts of terrorism and acts of, uh, and goals of trying to drive Israeli into the, Israel into the sea, then it's a different type of organization and that may indeed open up different prospects for the peace process. All right, then how do you see, uh, putting aside the, the hypothetical then, I think you're right, how do you see a Dukakis administration seizing the diplomatic initiative, which everybody on all sides of the issue recognizes has to be done? What are the ingredients of a Dukakis initiative in the Middle East? Well, I think the, uh, what the governor has said is that he will work with both sides to try to bring them to the table together and to have them try to frame a plan that would move them toward a series of steps toward a larger peace settlement. I suspect the modalities for that might be to appoint a special negotiator for the Middle East who would be a high-level person with a lot of political clout in the area, 
who could move that process forward, and then as it begins to move forward, you might have a time when President would step in. Uh, I think the, uh, but it's one of these things where I, for the President to immediately rush in and to try to say, here is my solution, I will impose it on the region, I think would not only fail, but it would be enormously ca uh, expensive in terms of his political capital across the board. Uh, Dr. Haas, let us say that the, again, admittedly, hypothetical, but we are seeing this almost every day on the news and reading about it in the newspapers. Let us say that the demonstrations in the Baltic area of the Soviet Union continue. And let us say that the demonstrations in Armenia continue. Do you see a Bush administration encouraging further widespread demonstrations against established Soviet authority in the Soviet Union? I don't think the purpose of the United States within the Soviet Union or Eastern Europe is to encourage demonstrations per se. I think the purpose of the United States and the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe is to encourage freedom. It's to encourage, particularly in Eastern Europe, a rolling back of Soviet presence, a repeal of the Brezhnev Doctrine, and greater freedom for these people. Uh, demonstrations are a means to an end. What we're interested in is not getting people in the streets. We're interested in getting people freedom. Okay. In the pursuit of freedom in Eastern Europe, what would a Bush administration do? I think one thing you do is you make it very clear publicly that the question of freedom in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union is high on our agenda. And what you do both publicly and privately is you make very clear to the Soviet Union that an improvement in relations across the board, particularly in the economic areas, is inevitably tied to the situation there. And if the Soviet Union refuses to move ahead on meaningful freedom, both with, for its own people as well as for the people who are unwillingly under its control, then I think it would put tremendous limits or breaks on an improvement in U.S.-Soviet relations. Are you uh, thereby calling for what used to be described as a rolling back of the Iron Curtain? It is clearly the goal of the United States that the Soviet occupation of Eastern Europe come to an end. It is an unnatural re reaction, if you will, to the post-World War II period. I don't think that history is necessarily frozen for all time. And I would like to think that one day the people of, the Eastern, of Eastern Europe will be free of the presence of the Warsaw Pact and will be free of the political clout of the Soviet Union and Moscow. The, uh, the Kremlin has no business running the lives of uh, hundreds of millions of people. How do you uh, effectively advance that kind of very noble aim? How do you do it as a government? What would a Bush administration do? Then I'm going to ask you the same. <laughs> what you do, it's not something you necessarily move or bring about in sudden lurches. What you do is you clearly deal politically and economically with the countries of Eastern Europe and you try to establish dialogue, you try to establish ties, you try to secondly have an arms control process with the Soviet Union that brings about a reduction in the Warsaw Pact presence in Eastern Europe, and thirdly you make it clear to the Soviet Union that their vision of an improved East-West agenda will only come about if some of our basic goals in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union on the human rights side are recognized. The Soviet Union cannot choose from East-West relations like an a la carte menu. And I think what we basically make clear is that we have some control over the content of the relationship. Just so that we all understand, could you point to a, uh, a speech uh, by the Vice President in which he articulates uh, that kind of policy which you seem by implication uh, to accept when I, when I said rolling back of the Iron Curtain? Well, this administration countless times has talked about it. Vice President Bush has been in Eastern Europe on official business as Vice President, has spoken about greater freedom for Eastern Europe. And then just recently, uh, about two weeks ago now, the Vice President tra traveled to Fulton, Missouri, to Westminster College, where Winston Churchill in 1946 gave the so-called uh, famous Iron Curtain speech and laid out an agenda for U.S.-Soviet relations, which placed a heavy emphasis on human rights issues. No, but the human rights, I understand that, but I was really asking the question more in terms of, uh, of the rolling back of the curtain, more in terms of ways in which you specifically achieve the aims that you set. 
you know, the speech the other day mentioned some general points. The vice president probably gave a half dozen speeches when he was in Eastern Europe as vice president. And it seems to me it is implicit in everything we are saying about U.S.-Soviet relations and East-West relations, that the human rights element and the question of greater freedom for Eastern Europe has to be recognized, or it's not something the government even has to do. There's forms of tying or linkage which are inherent. They're unavoidable. And I think the American people and the Congress will not support a closer East-West relationship where somehow Eastern Europe is kept apart from its benefits. You, you'll drop off a copy of the speech tomorrow. Be glad to. Uh, Professor Nye, could you address that same issue, please? Yes, I think we all agree on a similar set of objectives of increasing freedom for the peoples in Eastern Europe. The question is how we go about it. And, and that we have to be cautious in one sense, that if you look throughout history, the greatest dangers of high risk in international politics are when empires are in decline. Austria started the First World War not because it thought it was going to win, but because it thought it was declining and had no alternative. If the Soviet Union is in decline, its empire is in decline, and I think you can make a strong case that that's true, then what we have to do is see if we can manage that Soviet withdrawal, that Soviet decline of its empire in Eastern Europe gracefully in a way which doesn't lead to high risks in precipitating a nuclear war which leads me to believe that the right way to approach this question is to press Gorbachev to put forward some of the same measures of glasnost and perestroika in Eastern Europe that he's applied in the Soviet Union. And some Soviets have said, indeed openly, that they believe the crushing of the Prague Spring in 68 was a mistake and that they wouldn't do it again. Rather than pressing for an early withdrawal from the Warsaw Pact, we should be pressing for that opening up inside the Eastern European economies and inside those societies. Part of that process is not only the political suggestions and <coughs> pressures which we mentioned, but uh, economic levers. The point is that uh, as you get economic uh, loans, as you get more contacts between Western and Eastern Europe, between the US and Eastern Europe, you can create a vested interest in allowing this to continue to progress. So I think there is a prospect for evolution in Eastern Europe, and we should aid and abet that evolution, but also keep an eye on the larger question of making sure that we don't become uh, uh, too eager too quickly and lead to a setback which would leave us all much worse off. And as for the footnote or the bibliographical reference, Governor Dukakis, Chicago, September, I think about the 12th of 1988. Okay. Um, what would a Dukakis administration do concretely to help Mikhail Gorbachev succeed in his efforts internally in the Soviet Union? Or does it feel it is not America's business to help the Soviet leader, quote, succeed? Well, most of what goes on inside the Soviet Union as to whether Gorbachev succeeds or not is going to be determined by Soviet roots. The changes that Gorbachev have brought about are deeply rooted in Soviet society. That's the major source of the cause. What we can do is make sure we don't make things worse. We have to be sure that uh, we use the opportunities that Gorbachev presents to strike bargains that are in, in our interest as well as in his. What I would be skeptical about is bending over backwards to help Gorbachev. For example, to sign an arms control agreement which had inadequate verification provisions on the grounds that this would help Gorbachev. The trouble with that is you might in a few years not have Gorbachev but still have that arms control agreement and be worse off. So essentially we want to stay even-handed to reach agreements, to use the opportunities that Gorbachev presents to reach agreements that are in our interests as well as his. But we have to be cautious or careful about not bending over backwards trying to help him and then finding ourselves a few years down the road worse off as a result. Would you like to add something? I always get uncomfortable with the phrasing of the question of whether the U.S. ought to help uh, Mikhail Gorbachev succeed. It seems to me we ought to have one goal which transcends any personality, be it Gorbachev's or anyone else's. Our goal ought to be to bring about some significant, lasting, enduring reform in Soviet foreign policy and to bring about some significant, lasting reform in the way the Soviet Union goes about running itself politically and economically. If it can bring that about under Gorbachev, great. If it happens under Gorbachev's successor, great. But this personalization of foreign policy, it seems to me, is dangerous for a host of reasons, some of which Joe and I just listed.
Good. Thank you. Well, now it is your turn. And uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please just approach a microphone and uh, address it. If you could go to the microphone, that would be fine. You go first. Go ahead. Um, this is, I don't know if this is working or not. Um, it's a question for Professor Haas. Um, in your speech at the beginning, you listed the peace breaking out all over the world and democratization in Latin America as if these were achievements of the State Department and the Defense Department. And then talking about Chile when asked about um, democracy there, you said we are making progress in this area. This for a foreigner is a rather frightening attitude which is that somehow every country is America's business and in every country the, far the State Department should have a policy. Um, to my mind this is what Paul Kennedy is talking about when he talks about intellectual and then military um, outreach and overreach. Um, and I wonder if the Bush administration really feels that every country is its business, and if not, how it sets limits. Thank you. Nicholas, you asked a large question. Uh, in the case of Chile, let me go from the, the small to the large. In the case of Chile, given the historic relationship with the United States has with Latin America, Everything we do, but also everything we don't do, takes on significance. In this case, the role of the American ambassador, I think, was quite key. When Harry Barnes went out of his way to meet with leaders of the opposition, when he pushed the regime publicly and privately to allow the opposition access to television, when he pushed the regime privately and publicly not to crack heads when people went into the streets for peaceful demonstrations, I think it had a tremendous impact. So I think the United States inevitably has a role, and the question is, is how we use it and whether we use it. Um, to opt out, let me now move to the larger point, to opt out is in many cases is not an option. If you have the United States play a smaller role, you will not revive the American economy to the extent it needs reviving. I think Professor Kennedy has it quite wrong on the relationship between our foreign commitments and whatever domestic economic problems we have. There just isn't the linkage he sets out. At times, the only thing I think in decline is the quality of scholarship at Yale. But, <laughs> but I think that one has to recognize that when the United States, if it were to take a smaller role, whether in the process of democratization or anything else, we do run the risk of creating elements of a vacuum. And in the military area, it could simply promote proliferation. In the political area, economic area, it could promote protectionism or a breakdown of authority. So I just worry about prescriptions for the United States doing less, because quite honestly, whatever problems the world has now, I could see them being far worse if the United States were less of a great power. Thank you very much. Uh, next question right here, please. Uh, Dr. Haas, I'd like to ask I you. If, hold on. I, I would like a question for Professor Nye at this point. We're going to go back and forth. Oh. Okay? But I will get to you in just a moment. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, right here. Um, I have a question concerning Latin America and um, Peru specifically. Um, Professor Nye, you mentioned that Mike Dukakis is specifically concerned with this country uh, about Latin America, and um, Dr. Haas pointed to the fact that this, uh, that this continent has, be, uh, has um, in this continent, democracy has. Uh, expanded nevertheless um, by the burden of the international that many of these countries have starved, are starving, and find themselves in an economic situation which destabilizes their democracies. I wonder what a Dukakis uh, administration would do to relieve um, these Latin American countries in order to stabilize democracy in this continent, and what specifically <coughs> you would think about um, the country of Peru um, or what a Dukakis um, that administration would do if in Peru um, a revolution, a Maoist revolution under the leadership of the Sendero Luminoso became imminent. The issue of the less developed country debt burden is extraordinarily important. If we're serious about keeping democracy in Latin America, whatever the relevant percentage is, you've got to restore the economic conditions for democracy. What you find in Latin America now is that there is more capital coming out of the country than going into it. With the exception of a couple of countries, you find that almost all of Latin America has had almost zero economic growth or negative growth in the 1980s. Those are extremely adverse conditions for maintaining democratic governments. 
If we're serious about supporting democracy in Latin America, we've got to do something to reduce the burden of that debt. Now, there are, Governor Dukakis has said that he would place some relief of the debt burden as a very high priority and would call for a, a summit of Latin American and North Americans uh, early in, the, uh, in his administration to try to do something about that particular burden. The particulars of such a plan, there are a number of interesting plans around in which debt could be bought up at market rates at about half the value, cutting the debt burden in half. He hasn't signed on any one particular plan, but he has indicated that some such plan is going to be a high priority in his administration. As for the particulars of Peru, uh, Peru now has in Alan Garcia a Democratic elected president. And I think Governor Dukakis would argue that he should be allowed to serve out his term under normal procedures. A uh, quick follow-up. I just think Peru, though, sh raises up two other aspects of the debt problem, which is that it's not simply one-dimensional of the responsibility of the outside world for the debtor country. I think that Alan, Alan Garcia's threats and policies of repudiating debt obligations are problematic. And so, too, is the need for structural adjustment. There's got to be efforts on the part of the debtor countries themselves. It can't just be increased foreign assistance. There's also got to be some responsible steps towards economic reform. I'm going to ask everybody to ask brief questions, and let's get some brief answers, because we've got a lot of people who would like to ask. Mr. Norton. Every president seems to get involved in the use of force. Even Mr. Wilson, who came in for some hard raps, got into that game. Uh, I'd like to have you comment particularly about two military episodes, either directly or through significance in terms of their cost benefits you didn't mention. One is Lebanon, and two, the aggregate U.S. support of the Contras militarily in Nicaragua. All in one minute? Uh, if you can, in 30 seconds. I think Lebanon is a warning that the use of force, while a necessary component of foreign policy, is not a panacea. And you've clearly got to be careful about the relationship of the use of force, the types of force, where you put them, the organization of it, the specific goals. Uh, force is, again, you know, not always perfect. There it didn't work, I think, largely because of the complexities of the, of the domestic situation. I'm not, however, convinced that the United States not acted that um, things would have been any better. To the contrary, Lebanon might just be one of those morasses where small amounts of force can be overwhelmed by internal developments. With the Contras, let me just quickly say that I think an, an integral part of any, middle, of any Central American peace process has got to be some incentive for the Sandinistas to comply with Contadora and Esquipulas too. I think we can look at economic sanctions, political sanctions, support for the internal opposition, and so forth. We can also possibly look for some incentives, economic aid at some point, but I'm afraid that in the absence of support for the armed resistance, the Sandinistas are simply going to take advantage of any respite to consolidate their revolution, which ultimately is bad not only for the Nicaraguan people, but, but for all the countries of the region. This woman has been most patient. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Uh, Dr. Haas, I'd like to ask you uh, what Mr. Bush would do uh, to bring about peace and justice in the Middle East. Again, in one minute. Uh, when I once was a young, I'll answer your question. When I was once even younger than I am now, I, I worked for a senator, and he was going home to his district for the weekend, and he said he might be facing some, some tough questions. And I said, for example, he said, on the Middle East. And I said, fine. He said, well, will you give me everything I need to know on a three-by-five card? <laughs> and I said, Senator, there are some things in life that won't fit on a three-by-five card and the Middle East is one of them. It's also one of those that won't fit in a 60-second answer, particularly now that I've used 45 seconds of it. <laughs> what I would just say is it seems to me the key to the policy has to be American consistency, continued strong support for Israel, continued strong support for the principles that we think would form a legitimate diplomatic process. In this case, it means making very clear to the Arab side, to the Palestinians or whoever is going to represent them, what the requirements are for an interlocutor to meet. And when those requirements are met, I think then the United States should be prepared to facilitate a diplomatic process. But things like Camp David only work when you have people in the region like a Sadat, like a Menachem Begin, who are willing to take major risks for peace. When that happens, I think we can play a key role in the Middle East. 
Until then, I'm afraid there are limits to what we can accomplish. Okay, in the balcony, please. Question. Okay, this is for Joe Nye. Um, you, you said that we shouldn't bend over backwards to be helping Gorbachev, but we should do what we could within our own interest to help him. Some old Soviet hands, like Richard Nixon now, are saying we should just forge ahead with our own program, that the Soviets are preoccupied. I mean, this, we're, we should be looking for windows of opportunities to advance our own agenda and develop an agenda to advance instead of letting Gorbachev set the agenda, which is what's happening now. Um, what kind of agenda would you set? Well, or I, would Dukakis? I think the comment is an intelligent one that uh, we should be taking more initiatives. The Gorbachev is extremely successful in seizing public initiatives, and we have been pretty much reactive. The types of initiatives we should be taking is putting on the table in Europe a proposal for deep cuts in the conventional balance, which have to be asymmetrical on the Soviet side, where they're taking larger cuts since they have more tanks there than we do. We should also be challenging the Soviets to come up with plans for reforming the United Nations to make it uh, more effective. I mean, they've begun to move in this direction, but we ought to press them harder on it. We should be pressing the Soviets in other areas, such as the environment and ecology. We should be pressing them in areas such as the proliferation of ballistic missile technology and chemical weapons technology. There are a whole series of things where we could put initiatives on the table to press the Soviets harder. And I think in that sense, if we can find agreements that are in our interest as well as their interests, that's all to the good. They help us. They may also, incidentally, tend to help Gorbachev as well with his own domestic opinion. Uh, in the balcony, once again, on this side. Right. A question for Mr. Nye. I would like to ask you, Mr. Nye, about the governor's plans and policies for the CIA. But in doing so, I want to avoid the ambiguous word covert and just ask you if you know whether he has a commitment to broadly halt the illegal operations of the CIA, that is, those that violate the sovereignty of other peoples and governments, to halt that as a tool of American foreign policy. Thank you very much. Un unfortunately, I don't know the answer. I don't know his position on the CIA. I know that in more general terms that he has taken state made a number of statements about the importance of paying greater respect for international law, has condemned such actions as mining the harbors in Nicaragua, which was done by the CIA. So I can think of particular instances where he has criticized and condemned such interventions, but I'm not aware of a blanket statement that he's made on covert operations by the CIA. Question right here, please. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Haas, this may be a softball. I'm not sure right now. Um, Professor Nye specifically challenged you to show how uh, the Bush administration could not raise taxes and still carry out its very grandiose foreign policy and defense budget agenda. I'd like to give you the time to respond to that challenge now. Okay, good. As they say, I'm glad you did. On the defense side, clearly we're facing some tough choices. Let me just give you some sense of how we, I think we're going to meet them. I think we'll get some savings uh, from defense reforms, the so-called Packard Commission reforms of defense management. Clearly there's been enormous waste that just ought not to happen. Can't, can't be repeated. You've got to tighten up the Pentagon. That's one thing. Secondly, I think we will look to arms control, possibly to save in some areas. If we can get some agreements, that might help. Thirdly, competitive strategies. We don't have to match the Soviet Union tank for tank or aircraft for aircraft. There are some things that we can do better, and I think what we should do is emphasize or direct our limited resources into those high technology areas where the United States has a comparative advantage and where relatively small investments on our part can offset relatively large investments on their part. And lastly, there will have to be some defense cuts. I'm not going to sit up here tonight and say we're not going to have to eliminate some systems. We're not going to have to stretch out or extend, you know, slow down the rate by which we procure some systems. Of course we are. But I think it is strategically as flawed as one can be in the abstract to come up with laundry lists. One doesn't come up with, with lists for potential cuts in the absence of first fashioning an arms control strategy, in the absence of first fashioning a military strategy. Only then can you intelligently decide if you want to emphasize strategic forces versus conventional forces, or the land-based leg of the, of the triad versus the sea-based leg versus the air-based. I think that first you come up with a strategy, then you look at what kind of cuts you have to make. Just, just quickly, uh, my own curiosity. Uh, what is it that we have that's much better than what the Russians have, and what is it 
that they have that's better than what we've got? I think the Soviet Union is clearly, for example, better at producing large amounts of land base of land conventional forces, for example, tanks, artillery, and so forth. They are very good at producing those. Secondly, they're very good at turning out soldiers, given the price at which the wages and so forth in the Soviet system, manpower is something that is easier for them than it is for us to sustain given that we have a volunteer army. You don't quite have a volunteer situation in the Soviet Union. So what is it then that we want to do? We want to emphasize those areas of high technology where single systems can bring about or affect fairly large dis destroy ratios in terms of Soviet tanks. This might mean some certain high technology systems that could be deployed on the central front of Europe. Another one, potentially, I would argue, is SDI. And I think that is one of the clear differences between the candidates, that we clearly see SDI as an area of potential comparative advantage, where we are potentially better at going ahead in that technology, where the Soviet Union has invested a tremendous amount in its land-based missile force. And I think what you've got to do is look for areas in both conventional and strategic and see where the advantages fall to us. Mr. Knight, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, on, on SDI, we're probably better at producing something that won't do the job than they are. Uh, <laughs> but on, I think the general argument that, uh, that Professor Haas made is correct, that the American advantages tend to be in high technology. It's a pity to waste those resources on something which is the dream of a visionary president. Uh, it makes a lot more sense to apply those technologies of data processing and advanced sensors to conventional weapons to turn them into smart weapons so that the Soviet advantage in tanks can be nullified by our technology. And I would point out that Governor Dukakis made a speech in June of this year uh, calling for a conventional defense initiative to do exactly that. Thank you. Question right here, please. It's a question for Professor Nye. Um, how would Governor Dukakis enforce a diplomatic agreement or indeed make a diplomatic agreement in situations cited by Dr. Haas in Nicaragua and Angola in which the success of such agreements in a large ex to a large extent depends upon American involvement and contributions to parties involved. I don't think that Governor Dukakis believes that you're not going to need American involvement. American leadership is extremely important. I think what he said, just if we can take Nicaragua as the example, is that there are other forms of American leadership besides the use of force or the provision of weapons to the Contras. In particular, if you look back at what's happened over the last eight years, I think our policy in Nicaragua has been badly flawed. It's been all stick and no carrot. In that sense, I think what you can think of in terms of, uh, and what Governor Dukakis has suggested in Central America or in Nicaragua, is to build upon the ARIAS plan, named after the president of Costa Rica, and the agreement that was reached by all five Central American states at the uh, village of Esquipulas, in which they agreed to democratize internally, to liberalize against their opponents, and to stop sending arms across the border. And what do we do to enforce that? Well, one of the things you can do is get other countries, Canada, Germany, others that have suggested the sending of observers, try to get inspection teams against uh, a flow of arms by such countries, impartial observers, Another thing you could do is to have an incentive package, essentially a set of carrots, in which if countries are following out the Escapulis agreement, if they are liberalizing, opening up the press, allowing their opponents to have votes and so forth, that you can offer them assistance. And if they're not, they don't get that assistance. Indeed, for that kind of incentive package, you might want to try to get some Japanese and European money as well as American money and make it a multilateral initiative. So there are other ways to exercise leadership besides the ways that we've seen over the last eight years. Dr. Haas, a comment? Yeah, I think at least a prima facie case can be made that there's some relationship between strength and diplomatic success. The Soviets are leaving Afghanistan, the Vietnamese are pledging and seem to be on the verge of leaving Cambodia, and we finally have some progress in Angola. In all three cases, the United States and others has aided resistance movements. By contrast, in Nicaragua, the United States has ceased aiding a resistance movement and indeed never aided it to a significant degree and it's no surprise to me at least that as a result one has diplomacy that is dead in the water and I think one can draw what lessons one will but I for one draw a lesson that diplomacy that is not based upon strength will in the end be feckless. In the balcony please. Professor Haas, uh, 
I'm um, interested in the phrase that the Republicans have been using through the whole campaign, in the mainstream. My feeling is that the leadership of the country should, in fact, by definition, be outside the mainstream. And I'm wondering if, by being in the mainstream, in fact, the leadership is just, are, are just being followers and not leaders. Could you comment on that? Sure. I'm going to give two answers to that. One is an old conservative saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, I'm not saying things are perfect, but I certainly don't want to start fixing them more than they're broke. And right now, I think that the general direction of American foreign policy is clearly right. So I don't want to entertain uh, large departures, which is not to say, and come to the second half of your question, that simply leaders uh, don't initiate or innovate. They clearly do. And I think that in some of the speeches recently given by the vice president, in some areas, the key part of the speech is to stay in the mainstream. For example, on U.S.-Soviet relations, there are not grounds for departing. But in other areas, we clearly have to do more on the debt situation, on drugs, on AIDS, on the environment, on chemical weapon proliferation, on ballistic missile proliferation. So I think what you've got is a mixture of continuity and change here. And where I think you've got a choice between the candidates is uh, in their emphasis on the two. In the balcony as well, please. Yes, Dr. Haas, I want to return to a comment you made earlier about the importance of America as a model of ec economic activity throughout the country. It's also something that, that uh, Mr. Nye touched on in terms of the dynamic between economics and the defense posture, the role of America in foreign affairs. Rather than debate you on your self-promotion of the role of America economically, because I think that's clearly debatable, but you made the, drew the conclusion, I'll now point you to three items which I think affect that conclusion and ask you to comment on what you think this means in terms of a potential eclipse of that role for America. One is Japan and it as an, a clear engine of economic activity within recent history. Two is the prospect of the Soviet Union meeting with China. Three is the prospect in the future not too distant of the United States of Europe. And I think in view of those three issues for you to deal with, there may be a question about America's role in the future. You point to some of the... Uh the tectonic plates of history and where they're going. I think Japan is clearly emerging as a more powerful international actor, not simply in the economic area, but in the political area and even in the security area. Both, it's now got something like the third largest defense budget in the world. It's got a very modern capability. But I think the real challenge with Japan is not that Japan become a military superpower. I don't think we want that. I don't think the Japanese people want that. I don't think the Asian governments want that but it's to harness Japanese economic power and point it in the direction of strategic stability. For example, aid to the Philippines or Turkey or Pakistan. Soviet Union and China, I think something is, is happening there. Meetings are going on, things are improving. But I think there are all sorts of historical, geographical and ideological impediments to uh, anything like an alliance, but I think a reduction in tension between the Soviet Union and China is all to the good. I don't think the United States has any enduring interest in their enmity, much less any violence. United States of Europe, the United States has always supported a strong European pillar from the Kennedy administration on. I think what we have to be careful of, though, is that particularly in the economic area, a, grower, a growing knitting together of Europe, a so-called uh, you know, a real economic community, does not become a fortress Europe. The idea is not to bring down the tariff and non-tariff barriers within the continent, only to erect high ones between the continent and the rest of the world will suffer and they suffer. But clearly we are going to have to accommodate these changes. I think that is, uh, when historians look back on this period, those will be the kinds of questions they will ask, which is how well we accommodated those changes. I'm seeking a question for Professor Nye. Who has it? Yes, you go. Go ahead. Okay. Question to Professor Nye. I think I've heard at various instances Governor Dukakis expressing that his administration would want a greater burden sharing, a greater bar taking up over the burden of military spending by the European allies. This might in particular apply to a country like West Germany where you have a large deployment of American troops. Uh, my question is in the hypothetical case that these negotiations would not turn out the way the United States or the Dukakis administration would want to, and this is not completely inconceivable, uh, could you envisage a Dukakis administration withdrawing troops from a country like Germany? Governor Dukakis said in his speech in June on Europe and European defense that he opposed the withdrawal of troops from Germany, and I agree with him on that. 
American troops are in Europe for the defense of the United States as well as the defense of Europe. Uh, it's a common alliance of democracies which has been profoundly important to the global balance of power since 1945. It would be very foolish at this stage uh, if we were to break that or give that up. Now, among democracies, they're always pulling and hauling about uh, who's doing their fair share. Americans tend to often get somewhat self-righteous about this, and they say, we spend 6% of GNP on defense. Uh, the Germans, what is about 4%? Uh, but, you know, the Germans provide manpower through a draft, which means that that doesn't get shown in those GNP figures. The Germans provide all the facilities for most of them rent-free for NATO forces. They also suffer from all the exercises, those airplanes that recently crashed in Germany. That was a, an exercise. In that sense, we as Americans have to be very careful not to get too sanctimonious and self-righteous on burden sharing. The answer is yes, they'll always be pulling and, and uh, hauling about burden sharing. Uh, there are a number of things to be done. We can do more to develop joint weapons programs. We can ask the European allies to bring their ammunition stocks up to similar levels as ours. There are a number of detailed things. But whenever we get through with all this, we've got to remember that the interests we have in common in maintaining the alliance far outweigh the differences we have about arguing about who does the dishes. Question here, please. Okay. This is directed especially to Dr. Haas, but... Uh, if Professor Nye wants to follow up, I'd encourage that. Um, I increasingly, the environment is becoming an international issue with uh, rainforest destruction, atmospheric change, and um, also the issue of acid rain, which involves Canada. And over the past, I don't know, about 10 years, acid rain has been debated in Congress. And under the Reagan-Bush administration, just change has not been forthcoming. And I'd like to, well, it's been very slow, at least. And I'd like to ask how things would change or what would be done if Bush were president. Thank you. Though I pretend to be an expert on many subjects, I do not pretend to be an expert on these. Uh, let me answer your question this way. And I'm sorry if I can't go farther. I just don't know. Uh, in the last few months working on the campaign, one of the things that has struck me is the degree of prominence given to environmental issues. It is a, a set of issues whose time has come whether it's deforestation or global warming or ozone or acid rain or what have you, it is no longer on some technical back burner. It is now on the front burner. And I would not be surprised uh, if you saw major international conferences, Vice President Bush has, call, has called for them on international environmental issues. I would not be surprised if, for example, when the so-called uh, Summit 7, when the United States and its leading allies, as well as the head of the European economic community, get together, as they do for their periodic meetings, I would not be surprised now to see environmental issues be up there with the top two or three issues, along with, say, debt, economic growth, and so forth. Uh, I can't give you the specifics. It's just beyond my, my capability about what we do on acid rain or the rest. But it is now very much occupying people's attention. Question in the balcony, please. Um, this is for Professor Nye. Um, you said a few times that the governor um, is for an open world trading order and against protectionism. But in all honesty, that's not the impression that I've gotten from his speeches. It seems that he's made a few references against foreign investment, against, quote, unfair uh, foreign competition. Um, so what is the governor's true position on protectionism? I think if you look at the governor's record as a governor of a high-tech state with a strong interest in international trade, if you look at the way he ran consistently through the Democratic primaries in favor of an open trading system against candidates who were far more protectionist, you'll see that this man is an open trader at heart. On the other hand, there are areas in international trade where markets are protected, where you have to essentially be tough to get those markets in the other countries opened up. There are situations where I think basically direct investment in this country is in our interest, but it has to be a situation where in the country from which the investment comes, there is reciprocity, openness for our investments as well. So what Governor Dukakis has been saying is, yes, we stand for an open international trading system, but not one in which we are uh, uh, willing to allow others to do things which we can't do in their countries. We're asking for reciprocity and for uh, uh, that balance that I think is what he means by the terms about fair trade. In the balcony, once again, please. Professor Nye, over the 
past eight years, we've seen a number of anti-terrorist actions by the Reagan administration, from bombs to Gaddafi to cakes to Khomeini. What will the Dukakis administration do specifically? I, will, I already heard again and again what it won't do, but what will it do? Well, terrorism is not the kind of thing where you have a, a simple uh, answer. I mean, the, the, the simple thing that the governor has said, which I wish his predecessors had paid attention to, is not bargaining hostages, uh, uh, bargaining with terrorists about hostages. But if you ask what it is that you need for an anti-terrorist policy, it's a combination of things. It takes close cooperation with other countries. It takes uh, very good police work. It takes efforts to find out what are going on in terrorist networks and uh, uh, getting the kind of cooperation with others where they'll help you to respond to them. Terrorism is not the kind of thing which responds to a single grandiose solution. One thing it does, however, I mean the point that he has made time and again and I think is right about, is that you have to have a strict principle of not bargaining with terrorists about hostages. We have time, I think, for another question, possibly two. Uh, before I ask uh, Professor Nye a question, I would like to answer the question that you posed, Professor Kalb, to Professor Haas and give you an example of a country in Latin America. Time really for a oh. question, please. Then I'd just like to give you an example of a free press. In Mexico, the coverage of the recent elections, in my perception, demonstrate a tendency towards free press. I think the caricaturization caric of the President elect Salinas and the coverage given to the opposing party, opposing parties, is an example of free press. I, I would just like to... Do you have a question? Well, yes. Question all you want? That's fine. Uh, okay, that's good. <laughs> there, there was a question. It's very short. Let's Professor go. Nye. Uh, the present... Uh, uh, is that the third question to Nye in a row? Hmm. Well, who, it who can be answered by Professor Haas. I can go either way. <laughs> you have a question for Mr. Haas? <laughs> you. Okay. No? Who has one for Haas? It goes either way. Uh, the, the examples given to us by a foreign policy in South Africa of trying to seek development through cooperation, cutting, uh, avoiding sanctions against the government, and then the example of Nicaragua, th where you try to seek development through conflict, are conflicting. And I would like to know if it is just a question of using either one when you think they're convenient to the American purpose, or can you present a continuous, consistent uh, policy of conflict or of cooperation? I Thank think you. you asked a good question. Uh, what one can offer is not necessarily a con consistency that you always do the same thing. I think what you can do is have a consistent set of guidelines and a consistent set of principles. I think in South Africa, my basic policy and that of the Vice President is our belief that sanctions are counterproductive, that it would simply undermine the black majority that one is trying to support. It would work against the emergence of a black middle class. It would at the same time force the white minority and the Afrikaner in particular even more to dig in. The idea of going beyond that even, and Governor, I'm not saying that Governor Dukakis has supported this, but the idea of giving aid, for example, to the ANC or some other group on some kind of a parallel to the situation in Nicaragua, it seems to me just doesn't wash. One has to ask certain questions. For example, is this group likely to be democratic? Is this group likely to be viable? And it seems to me on a host of grounds, the situation in South Africa does not warrant support for the United, from the United States for armed insurgents. Okay, we are uh, very quickly running out of time. I'm very sorry. There won't be any time for any more questions. I'm going to use the rest of this time to ask our two panelists to summarize their comments. Uh, a final comment from each, starting with Professor Nye. And you've got a minute. All right, I guess you expect me to remind you that Professor Haas never answered my question about how they were going to balance the budget, uh, but I'm not going to spend my time on that. Uh, I'm not going to remind you about what Herb Stein said or the New York Times. I'm not going to spend my minute on that. What I want to do is raise something else with you. A number of you here tonight are students. A number of you will be voting for the first time. Let me tell you something, that no matter what you think about the candidates or the quality of the debate in this country, you have a privilege which is pretty rare in the world. Why should you vote? It may not be that one or the other candidates exactly fills your bill, but there's something it tells you about yourself and about what it means to be part of this country if you vote. So what I want to do is use the rest of my one minute to urge you to actually get off your couch 
and go out and vote. And the reason it's important is because if you don't do it, you are a lesser person, lesser citizen for not having done it. And I mean that even if you have to vote for Bush, but I hope you won't. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Haas, your concluding one-minute wrap-up. I hope it doesn't undermine me in the Bush campaign to say I heartily endorse the last comment by my, uh, my colleague. It probably will. Uh, <laughs> I doubt it. Um, two points. One, at the risk of violating the political rule of not responding to, to your opponent, <clears throat> the budget is coming down. It's got a long ways to go. What we don't need to do or even want to do is bring it all the way down in one year. That would be a, a major type of gear change that I think would probably strip the gears of the economy. Nobody wants to do that. Tax revenues are growing at a historically high rate, over 8% a year. It seems to me easy to keep spending growth under 4% a year. That differential will very nicely begin to retire the deficit at a rate that the U.S. economy and the world economy can endure and indeed benefit from. More generally, I think that Joe Nye has presented tonight an extremely reasonable, coherent, and cogent view of what Michael Dukakis is now saying. And the question I would ask is whether what we are now hearing from the Dukakis campaign is at all realistic in terms of what it truly believes. We have been attacked quite a lot, not tonight, but in general, for running a fairly negative campaign. What I would say in response is that negative campaigning, which I do not think we are by and large doing, works though when there is a grain of truth. And I do not think the Democratic negative campaign largely worked against Vice President Bush because there really wasn't a grain of truth in it. But I do think a lot of what we are saying about Governor Dukakis is sticking because the American people sense that, to come back to a phrase that's been used a lot tonight, but I do not think too much, that the Democratic Party has once again put up someone who does not represent the kinds of policies that have, in a sense, brought this country to where it is today. If you are largely satisfied with where we are today, it seems to me one ought to stick with the vice president. If one does want radical departures, then I do think the governor from Massachusetts ought to be your candidate. Okay. Well, thank you both very, very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to close, please, with an announcement and a very brief comment. The announcement is that tomorrow here at the forum there will be another very interesting event called Tales from Campaigns Past. It will be a panel discussion of political punditry and the swapping of war stories with such people as Ed Rollins and Richard Mastrangelo, Dave Gergen, Kathy Bushkin, Les Francis, Jody Powell, and Chris Matthews. And that should be fun. It will be here at 8 o'clock tomorrow. And my final comment is, wouldn't it be wonderful if both candidates had been able in the course of the last four months to talk about foreign and defense policies as our two panelists did tonight? Thank them, and thank you all for coming.